Hi, my name's James Harrison, and this is Uncommon. Uncommon is a production by Neural, a full-service digital agency. If you want to grow with a premium agency and have the ability to work with Jordan directly, then learn more at neural.com slash media and request a callback. That's N-E-U-R-A-L-L-E dot com slash media. My name is Jordan Michaelides and I'm your host on a show where we dig deep on unique individuals. If you like the show, subscribe. We would love that. It gives us a lot of support and helps us keep things going as well. You can always give us a nice little like, which is always useful. Show notes are down below, just in the comments section. You can also find the link there in the description. It's neural.com slash podcast for all previous episodes. If you want to listen to the audio, if you don't want to be watching it on YouTube, you can find us on all your good podcast apps. That's Uncommon Show. Uh, You'll be able to find us everywhere. If you want to see behind the scenes with us, what we're doing each week, search Uncommon or at Uncommon underscore show. Uh, on Instagram and you'll find us there. But uh, what can I say? Thank you so much for checking us out and uh, let's get into it. My guest this week is James Harrison, host of the self-titled show and podcast. Um, I've been following his work for a little while. We connected over, I think it was Instagram. Initially, I've been a guest on his show and I love to get people in who are fellow podcasters and media industry types. So yeah, James. Thanks for coming in, mate. Thank you so much, Jordan. It's funny to have the roles reversed where I'm actually <laughs> answering questions now instead of asking. Have you been on many um, other podcasts? Not many. I've actually had one of my friends. He decided he was going to start a podcast last week, so he he asked to interview me. And yeah, it was a strange experience because I don't know if you found this, but I feel like being interviewed and interviewing someone they're similar, but they're actually kind of different skill sets. They're very different. Yeah. Like being um, being interviewed, you actually need to have a a story. Yes. But like you can't go into in, you can't go into an interview like your very first interview and just have nothing in your head about what's going on. Yeah. Um, you've got to have some sort of ideas to who you are and whatnot. Whereas, like being like being an interviewer, you've got to be really well prepared and well structured. It's just totally different. Yeah, it's almost like you, when you're interviewing someone, you do all the work on the front end to make sure you have like the the questions ready and all the topics you want to talk about. But when you're being interviewed, it's almost like you have to know what you're about, Mm. but then it's more about actually being able to share that and articulate that well, which is challenging. Did you, what, like I I get, do you get tired after interviews? I do, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Do you do you find that did you find that more with being interviewed or interviewing people? It's funny. I've probably about the same initially. You know, when I first started doing my podcast, which was about a year ago now. Yeah. I put in so much energy into the prep <laughs> and still do, but you know, everything's new, it's this new experience. I got so nervous before every single interview and then I was just so exhausted. I, I literally ended up taking naps after really? <laughs> interviewing people just because it really just drained me. But Yeah, I know the feeling. Uh, I still get it today. Like I f- feel like doing the interview I'm for the rest of the day I'm just I'm fucking exhausted. Yeah. And I don't know if that means that I'm an ambivert or more of an introvert or whatever it is. Like, I definitely know that I can be extroverted, but I do like to recharge. Yes. Um, but it's, it's very, very interesting. It, you, you get surprised as to how much work goes into it. Um, now, I asked Sunny a few things. <laughs> Um, and I was thinking about, geez, what do I open up with the opener? Yeah. Um, I, I was thinking maybe worst blunders on the podcast. Um, you caught up with Steve, former guest of ours, um, about point point hacking, which I know is a bit of a passion of yours. Yeah. Yeah. But um, Sonny had this thing about pants. <laughs> like, why does he find this such a funny word? Oh, man. It's a funny story. So, <laughs> yeah, so my friend Sonny, who who I've known for quite a while. We actually, he lives in Vancouver. We, uh. we connected via Instagram. And he's, he's always trying these different businesses um, on the side. Like he's always trying to, all these weird things that people wouldn't normally try, I guess, in normal mainstream society. Yeah. And one of the things that he had a lot of success from 
was uh, selling these pants <laughs> online, essentially. <laughs> and it's funny because we're just, we have these weekly calls where we like, tell each other what we're working on, problems we're facing, um, successes we're having. And one of the things that just kept coming up in all these calls was just how many bloody pairs of pants he was selling <laughs> on a weekly <laughs> basis. And the numbers are like, crazy. Like We're talking like literally hundreds of thousands of dollars <laughs> of pants. <laughs> and I just, every time he said it, I just couldn't take it seriously because, you know, he's like, yeah, selling, you know, I had a 10K day yesterday of pants. <laughs> and just, <laughs> it just sounds so ridiculous when you hear it. And I was just like, uh, yes, there's a bit of an insight. Have you joke. guys like worked out what it is about pants that makes them sell more than other things? It's a good question. I think... When, when you're selling things online, and it's something I've learned a lot from him, you know, it's, it's a combination of a lot of different things. So there's who you're targeting in terms of an audience with, mm. the, with the ad set, there's the actual product itself, and then there's the price point. And you know, there's a lot of these different levers that you can pull on, and this is just the thing that happened to hit with what, with what he was experimenting with. You right. know, there was a lot of experimentation to get to, to this point. Yeah. A lot of different iterations. He, he said that, um, you know, because he gave me, he did give me a lot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he said that, are you involved in that business now? I am, yeah. Yeah. So what what does the business look like? Is it uh, like an e-commerce yeah, pan, so pants business, basically? <laughs> that's pretty much what it is. It's a drop shipping business. So okay. essentially, for the audience, if they don't know what that is, it's essentially you sell products online yeah. um, but you don't actually buy the inventory and hold it or fulfill it so there's yeah, the yeah. supplier that does that um, you essentially just market it and then the orders and the customer service is sort of handled by someone else so pros and cons pros are you can start very quickly and easily and cheaply mm. um, cons are the margins are very small and it's you don't really have reality is you don't really have a USP a unique selling point because uh-huh. Anyone essentially can sell. So it's a volume selling. game. Essentially, it's a volume game, and yeah. it's it's really an arbitrage thing as well. You know, like there'll be reality is like it's even with this product, <laughs> the pants. Like it might not forever, it won't forever be sort of spitting out as much cash as it does now. Yeah. Um, so it's almost like you find the the sweet spot where there's an opportunity. You extract as much out of it as you can, and then maybe there's a point where... And the market will catch up. Exactly. But one of the benefits of it, in terms of turning into, I guess, a more long-term sustainable business, is that you can almost use dropshipping as a bit of a sandbox, you know, like test different types of products, um, sort of refine your your marketing skills and your pitch, how you pitch it, and find what works. Mm. And then when you find a, a product that does well, you can then then go and basically if you wanted to then white label it yourself or manufacture it yourself so you can increase your margins um, you can then go and do that but you've kind of experimented in a low risk way yeah and then found something that works so it's like uh, I'm starting to get it now like I've always wondered like I don't know if you see this you must get hit all the time like you're looking at stories and then there's a fucking ad from like <laughs> Reliance <laughs> Education <laughs> <laughs> Amazon fucking this or that yeah um when we start my YouTube channel, that is going to be one of the first things that I start critiquing because I hate that shit. Yeah, oh, um, it's funny you say that. One of my friends, <laughs> he takes screenshots every time he gets one of these ads. There's like some like 15 year old kid standing next to a Lamborghini, and it's like, oh, it's learn how I made five hundred thousand dollars this month. Six figure income. <laughs> um, it's always it. something like that. And uh, one of my favorite YouTube channels at the moment is this guy Mike Winnett. Um, I actually found him via Gary V because Gary V had him on his show and did an interview with him and he he came up with this thing called the Contrepreneur Formula (laughs) and it's seriously one of the most fascinating things ever because he talks about all these little tricks and gimmicks that these people use to sell these courses which they don't have any expertise in. Yes. Um, And then unfortunately, like, you know, you go to these events where... um, like Gary V's headlining or like a Grant Cardone is headlining, who's borderline anyway. Mm. Um, and But, you know, what actually makes these events run is all these people who are pitching afterwards and it's just yeah. all like do my course, 10 yeah. grand, yeah. earn six-finger income type shit. Oh, dude. it's <laughs> yeah. And totally, there's, man, especially with, 
e-commerce, <laughs> you have to have a very good BS filter. Yeah. You don't even have to have it very well tuned. You can basically just disregard 99% of the yeah. stuff that's out there. Yeah. And yeah, it's funny, man. I, th- I feel like it's, it's one of those things, the people who are making the most money aren't the ones shouting about it. They no, don't need to... They don't need to tell anyone exactly. because that's the whole thing. And, um, you know, like... I think maybe you and Sunny could have something there because I noticed like your podcast is based in the education space because I can see you guys maybe doing something like that down the track. But I want to just focus on Sunny because I've got a feeling that you guys met because he started the Bushido Code, mm. which I think became like a journal. Yes. And yeah. then you had the Habit Planner. Yeah. So I've, I've got a sense that maybe that's how you guys met each other on Instagram. Yeah. That's absolutely right. Yeah. It's it's funny how we met because the... And you've never met in person. No, we haven't met in person. <laughs> and this is, this is the new thing about friendships in uh, in modern times, I think. You know, like, I was even chatting to him about it one time. You know, when you're in... He told me a story of when he was in high school. You know, there was, like, this geeky kid and he'd talk about his, like, real-life friends as in, and his internet friends. <laughs> and then everyone just used to make fun of him and be like, oh, what's an internet friend? That's, yeah. like, the geekiest Not thing ever. You want about. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a real thing now, man. It's, like, a lot of people meet their partners online. A lot of people meet friends yeah. online. It's, um, I really think it's legitimate. So, yeah, it's actually how we connected. Yeah, it's how... it's Like, I mean, you can, you can see nowadays that people build these friendships that are actually based on something that they truly like. They're not sort of forced friendships based on the school, suburb, or clique that you grew up with. Yeah. And I think that that, that has made things um, a lot easier for a lot of people. Yep. Um, but, but, I mean, one of the things I asked from him was, um, what have you learnt from... What have you learned from James? And I, I think one of the things he spoke about was, although you are learning, it's the sort of the speed that you learn. So, like, you know, you guys are talking about something on your phone call, which you pub- published in your podcast as well. Yeah. And then four hours later, you'll be, like, messaging him with, like, a <laughs> screenshot of, like, whatever thing you've signed up with yeah. or, or whatever. And I guess I was curious, what have you learned from Sonny in the time that you've known him? Oh, man. <laughs> a lot of things. So, yeah, he's he's a few years older than me. And, yeah, I, I was actually saying this, this to him this morning because I spoke to him. You know, a lot of the way... I feel like a lot of the things we learn from other people mm. often comes from osmosis, you know. Like you see it indirectly. You, or? you see it indirectly and you don't necessarily say this is a characteristic that I learned from him. But, you know, you see the way he carries himself, um, or not necessarily just in his case, but a lot of the times we see how people carry themselves, ways they talk, where they, the way they move, and we almost subconsciously adopt those traits in people that we spend a lot of time with. Mm. You know, like, everyone's heard the quote, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with, and it gets thrown around a lot, but I really believe that that's true. Yeah, I'd agree with that. You know, like the quality of your environment, the people you surround yourself with, has such a direct impact on who you become and the things that you do. Mm. And so in terms of things that I've learned from him, you know, just the way he conducts himself, he's a very, very like masculine guy, but he's also very balanced, you know, like he's, he'll do like a hard workout and be like this real like, like gym junkie kind of guy, but then he does like choir, you know, like, so it's like these two opposing <laughs> yes, yeah. things. And I just, I always admire people who find balance in themselves, mm. whether it's like masculine, feminine energy, or like just their career and their family, or just overall give that kind of balanced aura. And that's probably yeah. the biggest thing I've learned from him. There's, there's a lot of different er- directions I could take this. Uh, I'm, I'm curious to come back to that business and yeah. I guess... Because like one of the books I noticed that you talk about a bit with him has been the luxury strategy. So I wonder if that plays into it. But maybe we'll, we'll just talk about the habit planner. Mm. Do you spend spend much time on marketing that much these days? Ah, uh, it's a good question, and not really. <laughs> is the <laughs> truth because I don't know. I was saying to you before we start recording here. I always like to run a lot of experiments. You know, yeah. Like still, just like testing things seeing what works, seeing what doesn't work, kind of refining, you know, I like to, I still don't know where I'm going exactly. I haven't figured it all out as I think most of us haven't. Yeah. But, you know, 
one of the things I always try to do is it's almost like a process of elimination or iteration rather than having this concrete goal and then working towards exactly that. Mm. You know, so the Habit Planner was one of those experiments where it was actually a guy I previously interviewed, a guy called Alex Icon. He just oh, right. made a he made a killing off um, selling these journals. It's called the Five Minute Journal. I'm not sure if you've yeah, yeah. heard of it. The icons, yeah? Yeah. They've got yeah. that podcast. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the thing the Daily Talk Show just interviewed them when they were over in LA. Oh wow. Yeah, yeah cool. So, yeah, interesting guy, and um, he's had a few interesting businesses over the years. And, yeah, I just saw what he did with, with his company, with this five-minute journal. That was, and I kind of saw, that was when I kind of first thought about trying something in e-commerce, you know. Mm. He just, a simple thing, you know, he has this book. It's a journal with his own system that he's created for cultivating gratitude. That's the whole idea behind it. And he, he even published, like, you could literally download the the format of this journal and just have it on a pdf and write it on a piece of paper if you want to you don't even have to buy the journal right but it was just the having that kind of nice book that people could use was just uh, um, something that resonated and so that kind of got my gears turning of like well i've actually got this system that i use myself like when i want to try and implement good habits and i've kind of had it i write down in a journal myself how to do it so why don't I just try making into a book and yeah. selling it essentially <laughs> yeah and, and I can see where that would have in and of itself that project would have taught you a lot about marketing as well yeah which would have helped later down the track with the pants <laughs> with <business>. the pants <laughs> moving on from journals to pants <laughs> <laughs> um maybe we should get into some context of why the habit planner and your focus on habits exists because I, I agree with you if, if I look at my own um quarterly planning on goals or you know focus so to speak one of the key things i have is when i articulate a goal um one of the 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 third thing i do is articulate what is the habit that will define the goal because i find that you have to be i cannot be the type that will um you know like let's say it's got six stages and i have to do these things i need to just be doing something on a daily or weekly or monthly basis towards that yes that goal and i find that that becomes like a habitual type thing. Yep. Um, but maybe let's just get into your, I guess, self-improvement journey. Mm. I, I guess I was curious, I think you grew up in rural Victoria, is that right? Uh, well, I've moved around a few different places. So I was actually born in Brisbane. Uh-huh. Um, my dad was in the mining industry as oh, a geologist. Wow. So I've lived in some random places. <laughs> <laughs> um, lived in Perth for a bit. I lived in a place called Cobar, which I don't even actually know where it is. It's, I think, in rural <laughs> New South Wales. But I actually moved to Melbourne when I was still quite young. Wow. So I feel like I'm from Melbourne, essentially, because I was yeah. still young enough when I came here. Uh-huh. Um, but my parents have actually moved out of the city now into country Victoria. That's so, right, because yeah. I noticed there was an ol- I think it was an olive tree in one of your posts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they- you- you get back there probably once every week or two or uh, so? Once a month, probably. Yeah. Um, yeah, my dad, he's the kind of guy who just loves sort of like tinkering around and playing with things and playing farmer. <laughs> and so they <laughs> bought this uh, property with an olive olive plantation. So that's kind of his no shit. mission at the moment. <laughs> Does he make his own like cold press olive oil? Yeah, type so, of? yeah so there's a, they make it, most of it into oil. Wow. Which is really good. I'll bring you a bottle. Next yeah, do bring us a bottle. I, I mean, like, we consume, like, two litres of olive oil a week. Oh, wow. Yeah, g- <laughs> Greek family, like, it goes on everything. Yeah, you, you'll probably like it then. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Um, but that's my favourite thing is, like, um, homemade olive oil is always way better than any of the shit that you get at the supermarket. Just because um, it's not mass produced. That being said, um, Cobram Estate is a fascinating business. And I think we're speaking to... Um, someone who knows one of the founders to get them on the show. Mm, awesome. um, it's a fascinating bit. Like that Cobram business is so big that it has its own airport. Wow, I didn't yeah, know that. Yeah, like a private airport to, <laughs> to bring people in for doing things, yeah, right. little jobs, whatever it may be. And apparently like all of their olive is used now. So like that, you know, when you press olives, you only just get the juice of the olive. There's still a lot of it left, yes. like the pulp and yeah. everything. And most of the time, it just gets pureed into something that gets fed to pigs. So now they've like used that to make all sorts of like body scrubs and oh, wow. skincare products and all that, which is really interesting. That's the most interesting thing. When I love it when people take a waste product yeah. and find a way to make money from it. Yeah, I love that. Um, now, what I was thinking about 
from your parents? Is there like a lesson that you've, that you've learned directly or indirectly from them at all? Oh, that's a good question. I think probably the biggest thing I've learned from my parents is, and what I'm really grateful for, is the fact that they never expected me to do anything or pressured me into doing something mm. out of their own insecurity. Right. Because I feel like a lot of the time you see parents kind of pushing their children in some direction, which is good to obviously you want to guide your kids and yeah. like push them to succeed. But sometimes it's out of a bad place where the parents are actually insecure yeah. and they want their kids to... They want to live vicariously through their kids, yeah. you know. You must be a doctor or you must be an accountant or lawyer exactly. or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. And so that's very prominent in the WOG community. <laughs> I, can, I can guarantee you that. Yeah. <laughs> so it's funny, it's a fine balance because sometimes it can propel the kids to strive and succeed. But in a lot of the cases it I think it's a bit of a negative thing. And so, you know, I'm really grateful because then I never I never felt like I had to do anything or conform to any like societal norm or mm. you know I never felt like I was less than against other people just because I maybe didn't achieve something yet or whatever and it's actually worked in um, in terms of it hasn't reduced my drive it's actually <laughs> almost increased my ambition Interesting. because it's intrinsic motivation not extrinsic, extrinsic motivation yeah. which I think is key yeah yeah because uh, this is one of the things I've spoken to my partner about about how we will bring up our kids because mm. Um, I remember when I was a kid, like, junk food was a big no-no. It was, like, kept under lock and key. Mm. Whereas in her household, it was sort of freely available. Interesting. And they have, a, I think, a healthier relationship to um, certain, certain things like that. Wow. So they won't go stuff themselves. They just, you know, if they want something, they'll have it. And I, I just think that's a healthier mindset. Yeah, cool. Um, so, yeah, that, that that is a big thing. It's sort of that just guiding, like, shepherding yeah. someone through life so sort of like your parents were the farmer <laughs> and just guiding you along yeah. along the way yeah you studied um, mechanical engineering which I've, I've found really interesting and you, I know you were an undergrad at Orica and then you were a sales engineer at Ultraspin yeah um, why engineering what was sort of your uh, did you know at a young age that that was sort of where you wanted to go initially <laughs> It's funny. It's uh, I feel like in my life I've done a lot of stumbling around, and this is kind of a prime example of that. I think, you know, it's it's funny. One of the kind of maxims I live by now is begin with the end in mind, mm -hmm. which is something from uh, Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And I definitely didn't do this <laughs> in my earlier stage of life because, <laughs> you know, when I was in school, I kind of just fell into whatever subjects I was doing. You know, it was like, oh, I'm pretty good at maths, so I'll do maths, do like methods, specialist, blah, blah, blah. And then I got like good grades, so I was like, oh, what can you do with like good grades and maths? Oh, engineering, <laughs> like that sounds good. But I never actually stopped and asked, do I want to be an engineer? Like, is this yeah. something I want to pursue? Like, why am I actually doing this? And so... That's interesting. Yeah, so I kind of just did that. I kind of just fell into that degree and did that. And um, I definitely don't regret it. Uh, it was a good experience and... It's a, a very, very valuable skill set. Yeah, exactly. And it's something, I guess, probably the biggest thing I learned from that degree was nothing to do with the pumps or the, <laughs> the like, oil pressure, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. It was more just like that analytical mindset, yeah. which is, as you would know, very useful in business. Yeah, so. well, I was doing a client interview the other day and two of the staff were... Um, we're engineers, and I think that what I said to them is I've noticed with engineers it, is it makes you rational, so you have a scientific approach, yet practical. A lot of scientists are, like, you know, really into basic research, which will allow them to meander around about why moles are more likely to survive in this It has no practical yes. application. Yes. And whereas I find that engineers are very, very practical. It's why my brother went from doing maths as his postgrad because he – he did maths undergrad, then he's like, oh, well, I guess I'll go do research something. And he's like, fuck this. No <laughs> way. That This is so boring. And then he, he went to software, which is very, very practical. Mm. Um, mm. So I can see where, like, I can see how it molds well with your personality. Like, I get a sense that you're very conscientious and analytical. And so that sort of um, engineering would mold well with that skill set. Yeah, totally. Do you think 
what are sort of the, the things that stand out to you that you've learnt from that time before you got into or started working for Bike Exchange? Mm. Uh, as in, as working as an engineer? Yeah. Or, um, yeah, it's really... The main thing was developing that analytical skill set or actually applying that to things, you know. Mm. You know, my first job, which was, as you mentioned, at Ultraspin, there was a lot of... I was doing a lot of practical engineering in terms of applying those skills, but yeah. there was also other areas of the business that I was working in which required, which I could apply that same sort of fundamental skill set of being analytical and do that well too. Mm. So I think that's, yeah, really it was just kind of applying that analytical nature. Yeah. Initially. I know you're a bike geek, <laughs> but, but I guess I'm curious as to how you got into the bike exchange and why you thought, okay, engineering is not for me. Yeah. And how, how did you, because yeah. it's very hard, like commitment and consistency makes us continue down a path yes. oftentimes. So I'm just very curious much. as to how you decided that this wasn't for you and you're actually going to take a different path. Yeah, it's a good question. So when I was working at Ultraspin, my role was a bit of a mix between sales and engineering. Yeah. So it was technical sales, essentially. It was a mining equipment vendor where part of it was specking up a system for oil and water treatment, but part of it was also selling that system to, to mining companies and various other industries. So it was funny because I was actually really coming from this massively analytical degree where there's not really much like people interaction or soft skills like prioritized at all. And then coming into this almost like half, half sales engineering role, I found I was really good at the sales stuff, but not that great at the engineering side of it as well. <laughs> so <laughs> it kind of got these, these gears turning my mind. It's like, well, am I doing the right stuff here? Oh, shit. So I worked there for a bit and then, you know, it's just one of those things kind of have a quarter life crisis or whatever. I wanted to go do a bit of traveling around. So I did that for a bit. And then came back and again a bit of stumbling around <laughs> had a friend who worked at this company bike exchange and uh -huh. and they needed someone who was more in sales and it was an interesting business you know like they they won telstra business of the year in 2013 i think i saw that yeah. raised a lot of money from some high profile investors in australia so the founders did really well so it was a really interesting business to me just to observe yeah and then yeah kind of the interests aligned as well so i've got a mate who does a lot of um or a guy i went to school with who does a lot of cross-country riding yep and he's really into i don't I can't remember what the bike trail app is called but i remember him years strava. ago it may have been strava but i got a feeling that it's more like he built an app that um, shows you these trails or tracks or okay. something like that. It's definitely not called Strava. Okay. Um, but I know he uses it. A lot of people who ride bikes use Strava. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, he, keep he kept referencing Bike Exchange because he was regularly selling or buying or, yeah, right. you know, like he was always doing something around yeah, yeah. that. So you, I saw it in his stories quite a lot. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> That's cool. And then I remember seeing, like, in... Um, what's that publication? Smart something. Smart... Um, business smart, company? smart companies yeah. that's it i feel like that's it and yeah. it talks about like local startups yeah yeah i think so yeah and then i and then i saw a bike exchange reference on that yeah so it's been around for a bit now it's sort of one of those well-known so, local startups yeah it's, and it's interesting how it's evolved as well because i'm not sure how much you know about it but essentially it started over 10 years ago now as this simple yeah bike classifieds you know it's like buy and sell bikes dealers could sell their their products on there as well so it's kind of like Nothing else like it existed, that whole marketplace model. Um, and then since then, they've actually kind of packaged up the software the behind Bike Exchange that they built, and now they sell that on an enterprise level uh -huh. to, to big companies who want to build marketplaces. Right. So, for example, Maya has maya.com.au, but they have the Maya Market as well, which is wow. basically a third-party seller marketplace. Yeah. And so they use that same software that was created originally for Bike Exchange really? to power their, their system. That's interesting. Yeah. W when you were at Bike Exchange, was it before or during your time there that you started experimenting with Habit Planner? Uh, that was, it was while I was there. Okay. The side. Yeah. yeah, so it wasn't before then. So no. it's interesting how that would have probably opened up this avenue and your interest in marketing, so to speak. Yeah, it's just, I guess I was seeing just the potential 
working there was one reason, but also just in general, the trend of e-commerce, um, you know, like seeing Shopify, all these other sort of tools that were becoming more common um, and really just, I guess, seeing what was possible. And, you know, I've always got a million different things going on on the side. So that was just <laughs> another one of those, those projects. Before I get into the brand of James Harrison, this is, I was thinking really a lot, like how do you remain relevant in a sea of blogs, podcasts and content? Mm. And how are you thinking about that long term? And then I, I sort of, when I was doing my digging, I discovered, you know, I, I think I really understood how deep you are in this biking thing. <laughs> like I found your tour where you went across the UK for, I think it was like four and a half years ago. Yeah, wow. You did some digging. <laughs> yeah, that was from Land's End in southwest England to John O'Groats up in Scotland. So it's like the south uh, west southwest. corner to the yeah. northeast, right? Yeah. Um, that's a pretty, that's an amazing uh, like ride. And then Lauren noticed that in your actual artwork, there's two Cadell Evans books. Yes. So, um, <laughs> wow, you really <laughs> detail oriented. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, what consideration have you ever given to molding that into part of the brand of James Harrison, whether it's the podcast or the content that you make and, and really you, because I've noticed that nowadays with this plethora of content, you've got to find a way to stand out and we've only just found ours really. Um, so I guess how, how are you thinking about that? Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know, it's funny, man. Like, <laughs> cycling is an interesting thing. <laughs> <There's>, <laughs> I, I love it and, you know, I've been involved, at, involved in, the, in the past and I still do it recreationally. I used to do it competitively, but uh, not so much anymore. But, I don't know, it's, it's, it's funny. It's, it was a big part of my life for a long time mm. um, and it still is a part of my life. But in terms of... That's, I don't know, I feel like I kind of, as with anything, you kind of evolve and change over time. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's funny. I, I feel like I kind of used it as an escapism for a long time, Did you? in a way. And what I've kind of learned from that was when you're training seriously, like for competitive cycling, you can be putting 20 hours a week into training, wow. which is quite a lot. <laughs> and so, you know, it's a good way to kind of <laughs> distract yourself from thinking about hard questions yeah, and, the and, reality. and realities. Yeah. And so at that point, it was a useful tool and something that I learned a lot from, mm. um, more so on the competitive side. I think there's no downside to it right now. The sort of relationship I have with it is pretty balanced and healthy. Yeah. But there was definitely a point where I was using it to kind of escape really? or distract myself from certain things so. what what do you think that performance in cycling does better than other sports or other fields of high performance mm, it's a good question i think the fact that and it doesn't have to be cycling but any endurance sport is really good at cultivating grit i think in someone yeah. because you know if you're going out for a four-hour ride which involves like these hard efforts and you know you've got like the the weather that you have to deal with as well like it can be like raining or it could be like 30 or 40 degrees outside and it's just there's a lot going on and you know like to actually be able to do that and then the recovery process as well of that mm. there's yeah it definitely it toughened me up <laughs> for sure yeah like when i was in school i was like the weak asthmatic kid like i, <laughs> I was never it's funny man like even when i finished high school if someone had seen me, they would have never thought I would ever be like, not that I'm like an athlete, but an athletic person. Mm. And it really, it changed um, a lot for me in terms of my health, getting into that. Right. You know, I used to get sick all the time. I used to, as I said, be asthmatic and I just kind of just gotten rid of all that. Do you have us? So you don't have asthma anymore? I No, so I don't take anything. I used to take regular medication for it. But wow. Yeah, it's kind of... I wonder what aspect of that that asthmaticness and the symptoms diagnosed with it um, was was related to capacity, you know, like capacity and health. Because I feel like asthma is one of those things that regularly gets overdiagnosed. Yes. If you have like a mild form of it. Yeah. I remember I had like this food intolerance and some of the symptoms I have lined up with asthma and they're just like, oh, you might be like slightly <laughs> asthmatic or whatever. And so they give you like a yeah. puffer. But I never end up needing to use it. Yeah, that's good. Um, I think definitely it's, um, 
yeah, there was times when I was younger, especially, I definitely it affected me quite severely sometimes. And it just when I got sick, I got like really sick because of that. Really? You know, like I had to have like a I can't remember what it's called, like a respirator type thing. Wow. This is when I was like really young, but um, yeah, I don't know. It's just ever since I started being more conscious about even like things I'm eating, exercise, which sort of was triggered by cycling. You know, it's just as you like build your endurance and strength, it really seems to cure a lot of ailments. Yeah, I'd <laughs> agree with that. Which is kind of obvious, but... And I feel like when people get into cycling, they get obsessed. Like my parents still to this day cycle every weekend. Really? Um, yeah, like on on Beach Road, like that's yeah. their thing because they live, they live down in Brighton. I think they'd ride to probably maybe Mount Martha and back. Yeah, that's um, amazing. Yeah, so... They've always been into it. My brother and I were into it for a while, but we sort of just got a bit bored. Like, it, <laughs> it's very intense. And, like, when you hang out with, like, the younger types, you go riding around the hills of Frankston and yeah. stuff like that. It, it's intense. Yeah. It's very, very intense. Yes. But do you, do you still watch the Tour de France? Ha. I don't. There was a few years where I did stay up and watch it and have, have late nights, but I don't know, man. It's funny, like, especially kind of been involved somewhat in the bike industry for a while when I was working at Bike Exchange. Like, it's... That's another thing, man. It kind of... It almost became work in a way. Like, uh, and not in a good way. Interesting. So... Yeah, I remember I had that with wine. I, I wanted to be like a sommelier. And yeah. um, it, I got completely burnt out just tasting yeah. wine at work. Yeah, I believe that. Um, interesting. Yeah, like, because I remember some of the fondest experiences I had was watching the Tour de France with my parents and my brother. Mm. And you'd watch like the highlights, and then you got the Gabriel Gatte. Uh -huh. um, you would have loved that for the wine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, like he does his, he's like the, he always has like a dish every day. Yeah. I don't know, there's something I've, I find really f fond about it. There's something different. Yeah. Maybe it's because it's on SBS. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's an amazing event for sure. Amazing I've event. I've never been to see it in person, but yeah, it's just incredible. And if you think about it as well, you know, you can have like a. You can have a football match or whatever, and it's in the stadium. The stadium doesn't move. It's in the same spot. Like, the people come to you. Yeah. But with something like a Tour de France, it's over 3,500 kilometers or whatever. Just the logistics to set that all up, close the roads, like, the moving the people around. It's just... It's I, crazy. I can't even imagine. And the people that follow it and, like, get so into it, you know, like, if a, if a rider starts to fall on the wayside or they're injured or something, people, like, run to the rider and, like, start pushing them yeah. and stuff like that. That's another th interesting thing about um, professional cycling is that what other sport can you literally go and push one of the athletes? Or touch the athlete. Yeah. Yeah, you insane. don't have that anymore. Mm -hmm. Like, I... I actually can't think of a sport that would have that. Yeah. I remember the days of AFL where that was a thing. Yeah. But that they're long gone. Yeah. Um, so the James the James Harrison brand, <laughs> um, like you clearly focus on creating content around self improvement and education and so forth. What What are you thinking about that? What does the future start to look like for that? Have you thought about it? Yeah, I've started to think about it recently. I think the way it all came about really was just out of curiosity, you know. Like I've always seen myself as a curious person. Like to give you a materialistic example, I'd see, I'd see like <laughs> someone driving down the street in a Ferrari or something and, you know, some people might look at that and be like, oh, like jealous of that guy or who did he have to screw over to get that Ferrari? But when I see that, I'm always thinking, what does he know that, I don't, that's allowed him to, to yeah. get to that point and buy that Ferrari. Yeah. So it's kind of a materialistic example, but I've always like thought about that and I've been interested in people and understanding, you know, being able to deconstruct how people got to where they got to and the things that have helped them. And so when I started, I guess, this journey of self-improvement or reading books, doing the podcast, all this stuff, it really just came out of curiosity, like wanting mm. to learn, wanting to understand um, how I could make the most of myself and live a good life, essentially, because that's that's what I want to do. <laughs> wanna... Yeah. So it comes from your own wanting to live a certain type of life, whether that be... Like, what what do you want 
do you think? Like, do you want, have you, because I know you're the type to, and I've seen it, you've really articulated all these little things, which I remember doing, I feel, feel like you're a few years younger than me, so I, I feel like at a similar age, I articulated it in a document, which I still have to this day, and I update it's probably once a year. Love it. Um, what What is the type of life that you want? Yeah. Have you thought about that? That's a good question. That? Well, it's funny. One of my friends sent me a quote from Ray Dalio where he said that all you need in life to be happy is a good bed, yeah. <laughs> good food, good relationships, and good sex. <laughs> yeah. I literally just read his principles book and it, yeah, yeah, that's like the first thing he talks about. Yeah, which is cool. And I think it's funny because it's funny, but it's also quite true. I think it's basic things, you know, and that's something I've learned as well. Like I've seen and interacted with people who make a ton of money and have got materialistic success and or but then that's at the expense of some other area in their life you know mm. and so when I kind of look for myself what I want I used to be very motivated by money you know that was kind of like the number one goal I was always thinking about that how can I make the most money but as I guess I've kind of matured and um, evolved in a way one of my I guess like core values is balance and when I say balance it's not so much um, balance on a day-to-day -day basis but you know what are the the key areas in life that I want to have success in because success for me money is one part of it obviously mm. but you know there's your relationships your personal relationships relationship with your family um, your health like how it's the most important thing um, and do you enjoy getting out of bed and going to work every day. That's what Warren Buffett says, are you tap dancing yeah, to work every day? Yeah, you tap dancing to work. And so that's kind of, that's the goal. I want to have a good life. And for me, a good life is defined by what are these key areas and mm. how can I make the most of what I've got and maximize all those different areas. And then as well, contribution, you know, like giving back, like fulfillment from that is something that I've only, not only recently, but fairly recently realized is something yeah. really important to me I think I think you're right I, th I feel like these are the years to find that out and it will take some years to find out I feel like I've just gotten to that point where I know what it is like this podcast makes no money but I absolutely love doing it and I feel like that's that's my contribution if that yes. makes sense and we've only just found a way to make money from it indirectly which gives us you know a roof over our head food all the basic things that you need in life and anything from this point upwards improving those two areas is just an improvement, Yes. if that makes sense. Totally. Um, uh, it sounds like there's a l lot of different people meshing into this view of self-improvement and leaders that you would respect. I noticed that some of the books you published, like Made in America, mm. um, I think it was Seven Habit, the Seven Habits book. Mm. Obviously, there's a Tim, Fo Tim Ferriss influence there. Mm. I know that I found... A bunch of people from Tim Ferriss, like um, what's his what's his name? Not Carl Sagan, but um, Richard Feynman. Mm. Then Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger have been big for me. Yep. Do you find there's there's a few people in particular that you like to look up to and just consume all of their stuff? Ah, uh, it's a good question. <sighs> really, at the moment, it's funny. There's different people at different times. Yeah. And different stages of my life that resonate with where I'm at at that point, if that makes sense. Yeah. And yeah, we were talking about that before, before it, we got on air. Exactly. And it changes. So I kind of have this wide uh, variety of people that I don't consume religiously, but they're kind of in my peripheral. And mm. then when sometimes there'll be one person I particularly resonate with and I'll grab onto what they're producing for a week and really just like go hard on it. And then there'll be someone else for another week. And, you know, like right now in this, this moment, there's a few people that come to mind. There's a guy, have you ever heard of uh, Nathan Latka? No, never heard of him. He's, he's an American guy. He's um, basically, he's big in the SaaS, like software as a service space. Oh, yeah. Um, and he's got a podcast as well. Just really interesting guy. Like he thinks, he's this young guy, just thinks like really differently to, to a lot of people. A lot of the stuff he does is just... Um, yeah, very left of field, but he does very well with it. And I look at his work. So with his podcast, for example, for me personally, I'm trying to do one interview a week, which for me is 
a lot of work. It's a lot of work. <laughs> and yeah. but then I look at him, and he's doing fifty interviews a week, five zero. Jesus Christ! And he publishes a podcast daily, and his backlog because he does fifty a week is like a year and a half. So if you go on his show and get interviewed, it won't go live for a year and a half. And his whole and so it just kind of shows me like. Where's my thinking at? Like I'm like trying to do like one thing a week. He's doing fifty. He's doing fifty times more output, but obviously he's not working fifty times harder. Like what is he doing? Jesus, that's of, insane though. It's insane. You should look at his stuff. And what's the name of the podcast? It's called the Top Entrepreneurs Podcast. The Top Entrepreneurs. Yeah. Okay. Interesting guy, and just um, and then it's when you look at him as a whole as well. What he does on the back end is even more fascinating because he interviews SaaS founders, CEOs, startup founders, and the whole point of the podcast is like a 15, 20 minute daily show where during that 15, 20 minutes, he gets a lot of numbers from his guests on their business, how they're doing, um, what they're working towards, if they're trying to raise money, all this stuff. And then he basically takes that data from his guests and he has this huge database of thousands of privately held SaaS companies that then he charges a lot of VCs and investors a subscription to have access to wow. because if they're looking for certain metrics of companies they want to invest in. And so it's, this is a really interesting example of someone who just thinks really differently wow. and monetizes things in ways you might not expect. That is a very different way of doing it. Yeah, yeah. The, the data insights. Exactly. He would have to have though like millions of downloads like he he must if he's publishing yes. daily so he must have a very big unique audience yeah it's pretty amazing to do that <laughs> fuck wow An- another another one that comes to mind as well is uh, there's another podcast host called Andrew Warner he's just the um, his podcast is called Mixergy yeah I'm not sure if you know I've heard of this one yeah. yeah really interesting guy he's I was inspired a lot by his format of podcast because mm. you know he's He's this guy who does crazy amounts of research similar to, to what you've done, you know, digging up all this random stuff. And every time you listen to an interview, the guests always are surprised at the stuff he's managed to yeah, <laughs> dig to up. Yeah, to find about them. Which, yeah. which, was, which I love. And then, but it's funny, it's this weird juxtaposition because he is so thorough in his prep and the, the content is so gold, but he's one of those people who doesn't really like care about the quality in terms of like the audio oh, and no. so probably not your type of guy no. <laughs> but like because people are not forgiving about that but it's interesting because um, apparently his audience is <laughs> but it's, it's almost like and I, I do care about audio quality and I want to make it as best I can but it kind of showed me as well what I learned from listening to him is that sometimes not necessarily with like audio production or anything but a lot of times in life done's better than perfect <laughs> And yeah, yeah. I think for me personally, that's a lesson I've had to learn because I always tried to do that. Well, it's it sort of rings out that, and this is a marketing thing, you've just got to align what you want to do, how you showcase that product, how you distribute it, has to align with that demographic. Like if your whole product is based around luxury and mm. and, and being very, very good at something, then people can start to expect yes. certain things. Yeah. So, yeah, I found that with ours, because of the, the style that we interviewed, that I wanted the, all the other little bits to suit the style. Like yep. if, if we're going really deep and in-depth, then everything else should be really deep and in-depth, totally. and that's the competitive advantage. Because totally. I'm always thinking about that, if that makes sense. But if, if he's done it and uh, automatically the audience doesn't care because that's how he started to do it, mm-hmm. then it doesn't really matter. Exactly. So, yeah. The, your own podcast, mm-hmm. um, you're about a year in now. I think you started, um, I had here, December 14th last year. <laughs> um, you know better than me. <laughs> yeah. What was the original thesis? Original thesis was, again, coming back to curiosity. You know, like I was, I was actually having interesting conversations. Probably the first five or six people I interviewed were people I already knew, mm. um, friends of mine. And... You know, I was having these interesting conversations and a lot of the times at the end of the the call, I'd be thinking, probably should have recorded that. You know, like yeah. a lot of people could have got value from that and it would have been good to be able to look back on. So yeah. then I thought about, you know, I was listening to other podcasts as well, 
Tim Ferriss, all the sort of usual suspects that you mentioned before. And the format just appealed to me. And it was kind of one of those moments where I was just like, you know, this, I like to run experiments, as I said before. Why don't we just try this? You know, I've got six to 10 people I can probably interview. Um, I feel like I'm a pretty good listener. I feel like I'm kind of good at guiding a conversation. So this could, could suit my strengths. Let's commit to doing 10. Mm. Um, I'll do it, do the work, and then if I hate it after 10 episodes, then I'm allowed to quit and I'll stop. But if I'm enjoying it, I'll keep going. And mm. yeah, I enjoyed it, so I kept going. Was there, what sort of been the thing that you've learnt the most? I was thinking originally, do I ask the best or worst? And there's nothing <laughs> worse than saying that. <laughs> so it's a pride guess that may be listening, but is there, is there something that you've gleaned so far from doing it that you've been able to learn and apply in your own life? Um, yeah, oh, so many things. I think one thing that stands out for me is that at the end of the day, people are just people. <laughs> yeah. You know, like... That's a big thing. It's a big thing. And what I really learned is that I said I started with people I knew, but then obviously kind of start reaching out to people, Cole reaching out. There's people that I admired and I saw as way ahead of me and above me. Mm. And I thought they'd be interesting people to interview. So I'd reach out to them. Some would agree, some wouldn't. But then I always found like the people who I did interview and I had interacted with, obviously, like I really admired them for what they'd done. And that's why I wanted to interview them. But then when you actually interact with them and talk to them, you really learn that they are just people <laughs> at the end of yeah. the day. And it's kind of helped reframe, I guess, how I view myself, you know, like I, I can see people have amazing achievements and it's great to admire them, but you should never put people on a pedestal, you know, yeah. at the end of the day, the person's a person and that's one of the biggest things I've learned. I think if it, it probably changed your mindset when you saw that person driving in that Ferrari going, um, how do I... Do what? What does this person do that I don't know? To I can do what this person's done. Oh, if that makes sense. Hundred percent. Yeah. It's like when you see what someone's achieved that seemed impossible, and then you interact with them and you see that they're just like you. Then that resets your own bar, I guess, in your mind of what you can do. Yeah. yeah. And and it's sort of um, it's better than going to someone saying, "Hey, you want to grab a coffee." Exactly. 100% man. Like, you can go up to someone and ask them to go for a coffee. They're probably going to say no, but hey, come on my podcast. <laughs> no worries. Let's yep. do it. Let's go for it. People love it. That's yeah. the thing, man. People, and I don't think it's a bad thing. Like, people love talking about themselves and their achievements, which is cool. And I well, wanna, they're going to get some value out of it. They're going to get some value. They might, might, you know, someone finds them that hasn't found them before. It can be saying that they can use themselves in yes. marketing. Yep. Why, um, I found it interesting that you select, although you talk about similar topics of sort of self-improvement business and marketing and whatnot, you put it under the education section. <laughs> was that to get a difference or competitive advantage or was it that you felt that this is really just lessons to be learned? It's mm, a good question. I think, so a lot of my guests are business people, entrepreneurs, CEOs, people who have built companies. So it makes sense to put them in, in the, the business category. But, you know, what I want from the podcast essentially is that I want it to be, it's not just business people. A lot of people are because that's what I'm really interested in. Mm. But, you know, I've interviewed people who have nothing to do with business, you know, like people who have done like 10 day meditation retreats and what they learned from that. You know, there's no sort of business angle there, but I found it fascinating. Yeah. And so... I, that's why I kind of put it in the education space because, and that's something I'm passionate about. Like I actually see myself as a teacher, mm. you know, and I don't, I don't see myself as a teacher in the traditional sense of this is school or cl classroom or whatever. But what I'm trying to do is take these amazing, interesting people, extract their stories and sort of get them to present them succinctly and distill that knowledge and then present that to people in a way that they can understand yeah. and resonate with. And that's what teaching is to me. So that's why it's education. And there's hundreds of other business podcasts. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so I think a it, bit of differentiation. Yeah. I think it just, it takes a different approach um, and it puts it on another level. And I, I, found, I did find that very interesting. Mm. Um, 
is there I, I, I want to ask you about books but I'm also wary that um, I should probably just put that into our rapid fire questions yeah, yeah. And, and knowing that I wanted to come back to marketing okay. because this was you know like I'd, I'd noticed that book that you referenced in the call with Sunny the luxury strategy which I've got on my list mm. now mm. Um, yeah how do you think about marketing generally because I find it interesting that you've come from this e-commerce background. I'm only really just getting into, like I've always come from a creative content background, if that makes sense. And I'm only really now getting into um, AdWords, pay-per-click, yeah. things like Facebook yeah. uh, properties. While I fully understand the platforms and the economics behind it, I've never really understood the analytics and getting smarter at that. Mm. So I guess, uh, I'm curious, how do you think about marketing? Yeah, it's a good question. And, you know, I definitely, I don't see myself as an expert marketer. There's so much I need to learn mm. about um, all that side of things. But I guess marketing, the way I think about it is you're telling a story and whatever way you're telling that, it needs to be in a way that someone can understand and, and resonate with. Yeah. So in terms of how you do that, you're going back to pants, you know? <laughs> like if you're marketing pants, you're telling a story of these these pants and what what are the things that people care about on this product that um, that they're going to want and how do you kind of match up all those different levers and, and there's a million different ways you can do it through running ads, through the, the footage you use in the video ads. Yeah. It's just all, it's a way to tell a story, you know? Do you think about... Like, are there key things that you think about, like, what the product or service is first, then, like, its price point to really define? Like, you're probably not going to do a video campaign for pants because it's going to cost a lot initially to set up. You're probably just going to focus on pay-per-click in some way. Mm. Yeah, so in terms of, like, the, I'm probably not the greatest person to speak to about the nitty-gritty of, of marketing pants and, and that sort of <laughs> stuff because, like... Um, one of uh, Sonny's brother, who's another partner in the business, is sort of handling most of that. But I see, I see how it works, and I can kind of see the high-level conceptual side of it. Mm. And yeah, it's more so with these specifically. It's like what are the what are the key features of this product um, that's actually going to be beneficial to the end user? Mm. So in this case, it might be they're like warm, they're waterproof, all these sort of key points. And how do you demonstrate that? in a way that someone who's watching it is going to understand. Yeah. So like video is a good format because someone's scrolling, they suddenly see this ad of, you know, like someone in the snow with these pants or whatever, whatever the case may be. And so that that's going to catch their attention and, and tell that story uh -huh. without having to necessarily say, hey, these pants are warm or whatever. Yeah. So Interesting. Yeah. Um, I want to jump into these rapid fire questions, yeah. knowing that we're nearly hitting an hour. Awesome. Um, you're a man of books. Yeah. I, I have had a chuckle at your podcast artwork with all the books <laughs> surrounding you. I'm just wondering, like, fuck, are they going to fall on him? <laughs> <laughs> they <laughs> did fall a few times. <laughs> they did fall. Um, you, you've mentioned in the past that you've read 65 books in one and a half years. I think we were talking before that um, in those early years, it's all about, like, quantity and pumping out the books you can read, and then you start to really focus on quantity. Yeah. So I guess I'm curious what have been the best and worst books that you've read. Ooh, best and worst. Uh, I got a few best. There's a one book that I love revisiting and I do often is Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. Oh, really? Have you read that? Yeah, I've, I just couldn't get through it. Did you? Well, did you get like a translation of it? So, the thing I like about the book is that yeah, it's hard to read. You wouldn't really read it cover to cover. No. Because it's basically for the people listening, it's a basically a, com a compilation of journal entries from this yeah. Roman emperor, I guess, or Greek emperor, or whatever Roman, emperor, yeah. Roman emperor. And it's all to do with Stoicism, so um, that sort of philosophical thinking. And what I like about it is that every time I read it, I'll flick through it, and then we're coming back to what I was saying before, you know, different people for different stages of my life. Something will pop out, so I'll just, like, be brushing through everything, there'll be one sentence that really stands out and resonates with something that in that moment was really useful to me. Mm. And so it's almost like a, a good reference that I just go back and back and forth with 
um, and get something new out of it every time. Uh -huh. so. I've got that with, um, you can probably see it on the desk just over there, The Art of Thinking Clearly mm. by Rolf Dobelli, I think it is. Yeah, and right. I find that just keeping wary of cognitive biases, I'm regularly looking back at that, mm. is really, really useful. Amazing. I can imagine the same thing with the Stoicism stuff. The thing that I struggled with was just how again like how heavy it is to yeah. read and i feel like books are also one of those things that like a book is relevant at a point in time exactly like i recently just read the undoing project which is about tversky and kahneman who defined the study of cognitive biases mm. but when i read thinking fast and slow i actually really found it fucking boring yeah but now i really really want to reread it mm. because i've realized the what's gone into that, those studies and how intrigued I am now about that. And so I think it's just when you find books. Yeah. Um, so I've stopped buying books in like bulk amounts <laughs> and I just buy them based on what I'm feeling, what I want to read. Just in time learning. It's yeah. the best way to go. Just about in time it. learning. I think that's the way to do it. Another quick one as well that was good for me was Andre Agassi's book, oh, yeah. um, Open. Why was that? Yeah. His story is really interesting. Have you read it or do you, are you aware of it at all? No. It's so obviously the tennis player, Andre Agassi. And what it really taught me was there's not much value in a life with, that has achievement without fulfillment mm. because for a lot of his life that was the case. You know, he was winning these tennis tournaments. He was world number one, highly ranked consistently and winning all these games. But, you know, the story of how he got into tennis, like his father, like forcing him to, to do it. Yeah. He hated tennis, you know. <laughs> And so it wasn't until like later in his life where he sort of found fulfillment in other areas. And it just showed me that you can be like number one or you can be driving the Ferrari or you can meet, like have all this achievement. But if you don't back it up with fulfillment as well, then it's pretty empty. Wow. That's really interesting. I feel like a lot of those tennis stars are pushed into it by their parents. Yeah, tennis and golf, it seems to be. Tennis and golf, <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, what does your morning routine look like? Ah, cool. Yeah, so... At the moment, I'm getting up at 6 a.m. and I do a one hour meditation sitting. <laughs> um, one hour? Yeah. Wow. That's so good. that's probably a whole other podcast on, <laughs> on that. But so that takes me to, to seven, so I do it straight away. Um, then I walk down to the cafe, get a coffee, come back, so I'm caffeinated. <laughs> I had my, I've had my meditation, then I get caffeinated. <laughs> then I sit down for about half an hour, read a book. Um, and then sort of fed my mind and then yeah have some breakfast and I'm good to go okay and your evening routine what do you normally get up to at night evening routine so at the moment I'm not great with it but I'm trying to switch my phone off at nine o'clock <laughs> <laughs> which yeah. is easier said than done um, and that's kind of the the only routine I have is to try and wind down by turning off the phone and I also wear these blue blocking glasses because uh -huh. um, they do help you sleep. I know, I know the ones. I feel like I've got them on my desk. You might be able to see them there, the really orange ones. Mm, yeah. I find mine are a bit intense though. Yes. Um, so I just have all my screens with like blue blocking stuff. Yeah. Um, what's in the fridge at home? Oh, wow. Uh, not much because... <laughs> so speaking of routines, so my... I eat the same foods <laughs> every day, <laughs> yeah. basically. So my breakfast and lunch is the same every day. Dinner, I have three different meals that I have twice a week. Yeah. So I literally only buy what I need, you know. a lot. Of, I used to have a packed fridge of, because you know, you buy like some spice and you use it once and then it yeah. sits there for six months until it gets moldy and <laughs> you have to throw <laughs> it out. So now it's just the fridge is empty at the end of the week. I fill it up with the same stuff, which is basically, you know, like some steaks, some chicken, salmon, and then some like sweet potatoes and bok choy and some other random vegetables. And then it's empty by the end of the week again. There you go. Systems. <laughs> yeah, I, li I like that. I think like Lauren and I have got like three dinner meals. Breakfast is always the same. Yeah. Um, for a while, I wasn't fasting. I was eating immediately in the morning and now I've started fasting again. I just find it it's a bit better. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, but that's because, like, for a while I was eating fucking pureed food. Yeah. Which I think we spoke about yes, on your podcast. So, like, I just got obsessed with the food again. Yes. I got a bit too overexcited, I think. But <laughs> that's good. Now I've, I feel like I'm getting my, ba my balance back now. What do you think of fasting as, um, 
I like it for the convenience. You know. It's very good for convenience. Um, it you don't need to eat when you get up immediately. Mm. I think like we all forget that the the body is more used to fasting than we tend to believe. Mm-hmm. Um, even if it's just you wait for a few hours after you wake up, and then you should just eat when you're hungry. Yep. Um, and that's what I've started doing again in the last just this week actually. Um, my issue was that because I was taking this medication, I didn't know whether I should be eating with the medication, but technically I don't have to. Right. I can take it actually wh- whatever time of day that I want, so long as it's a consistent time. Um, and so I feel like I just got lazy with it. Yep. I was just like, oh, yeah, I'll just, I'll just eat straight away in the morning. But now, yeah, I feel a lot better. Um, and I feel like caloric restriction well caloric restriction is the only way really to lose weight like there's the whole low carb high fat argument but both of them result in the same thing which is low calories so you can sit on either spectrum or you can sit exactly in the middle Mm -hmm. when it comes to your macros so um yeah i just find that do you do you fast in the morning i experimented with it for a little bit it can Um, make you anxious that is the thing yeah like i found that if I fast way too long and I'm working, um, it'll make me really anxious. Yeah. I get that sort of brain fog feeling. Yeah. Whereas if I wait like an hour or two, like if I just do all my things in the morning before I eat, that's probably better than eating first, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. I did experiment with it for a bit, but it's, it's I normally do workouts quite early. So I feel like if I do that, and then don't eat for a few hours. Yeah, it's pretty hard. Idea. Yeah, yeah. You, you're gonna you're gonna feel like shit. After. Yeah, you need to eat right after. Yeah, and I, I'd agree. Yeah. Um. All right. Last question for you. Mm-hmm. If you could have a billboard anywhere in Melbourne, okay. let's say, where would it be, and what would it say? Or what would it have on it? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I'd have it. Let's say, probably on the M1 coming in. Okay. Coming um, into the city. Coming into the city. Yeah. And it would say, so there'd be one line that would say, begin with the end in mind. (laughs) And then underneath, in small text, it would say, is what you're doing today moving you towards where you want to be? Okay, I like that. Just a question to ask yourself every day. And then the logo of the James Harris book. (laughs) (laughs) Subscribe, like and subscribe. (laughs) Um, Oh, that's so good. I like that. That's a good one. A lot of people ask that question. They just like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> buy my stuff. <laughs> yeah, put my put my brand on it. Yeah. Um, thanks for coming on. We're about to hit an hour and ten, but um, it's been good. Thank Where you, can John. people find you on the interwebs? Yeah, thank you, John. Um, best place. I'm most active on Instagram. So my handle's at J Harris, which is J H A R R I triple S. And I've also got a website, jamesharrison.com. And to keep everyone on their toes, Harrison has two R's and two, two S's. S's. It does. <laughs> so. It's an unusual way of spelling it. Like the Harris, yeah, but um, I wondered, is there like a bit of a Scandinavian yes, background in there? I believe so. Yeah. yeah. I haven't fully explored that, but I believe you're correct. So you've got an English background? Would yeah. You say? My, well, my parents, uh, the rest of my family is from the UK. Which part of the UK? Uh, I've got some around London. I've got some in the southwest, Dorset. Yeah. Um, a few scattered around here. And yeah, there. it would make sense. I mean, at the end of the day, it was um, heavily hit by Vikings. Yes. And, you know, I'm there, sure was... there was some Viking love back in the day. Yeah. Back <laughs> um, but um, no, thank you, Jordan. And uh, yeah, those are the best ways to connect with me. Awesome. All right. Thanks for coming in. Pleasure. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for watching Uncommon and this week's episode. If you like it, smash that like button. If you want to keep up to date with what we're doing, please do subscribe. We would love that. We'd love to build this audience that we're growing here of uncommoners. Uh, if you want to keep up to date with audio, you can search for us on all of your good podcast apps. It's Uncommon or Uncommon Show will typically find us. For social, you want to see behind the scenes this amazing studio that I'm sitting in, just search at Uncommon underscore show. Uh, and everything will be there, including our weekly promos. But um, look, thanks so much for stopping by. Until next time, thanks for watching.